Hello all and welcome to another one versus two. Now, several years ago I had a request to compare No More Heroes 1 and 2, which were on my list of games I wanted to play anyway, so I thought, yeah alright, and gave them a go. Then I wondered what to do next. Back in 2006 when the Wii was first released, I was in my first year of university, so I wasn't able to get one until late 2007, and the one I bought came with Red Steel, which I quite enjoyed. A sequel was released in 2010, but I wasn't able to get it. A friend of mine managed to get it on the cheap, so I borrowed it off him, and now, several years later, I've finally been able to give it a go. But, does it improve over the original, or does it fail spectacularly? Let's find out. I've said it before and I'll say it again, I'm not very good at FPS games, I like them, I'm just not very good at them. I enjoyed Red Steel when I first played it back in 2007, but I haven't played it for many years, so I gave it another playthrough and then played Red Steel 2 for the first time. I'm going to go down the usual route of picking a load of categories, comparing the two games in those categories and awarding a point to whichever game did it best, and then maybe delving into some minor aspects later. As always, the first thing I'll be comparing are the game's plots, but don't worry, I'll give a warning before I mention any spoilers, even if they are more than a decade old. Anyway, in Red Steel, you play as Scott, a former bodyguard who is dating a woman called Miu, and you're about to meet her father, Iseo. Long story short, Iseo is the boss of one of the largest Yakuza families, and Scott gets caught up in the middle of a gang war after Miu is kidnapped by a guy called Ryuichi, who says that he'll release her in exchange for a sword which was used to execute the son of godfathers called the Katanagiri. The Katanagiri. As long as you protect it, our enemies will not dare to hurt me. Spoilers start here, so skip to this time to go straight to the Red Steel 2 plot. Iseo gives you the katana giddy and dies from his wounds. You travel to Tokyo where you learn the ways of the sword and find help tracking down Ryuichi. You actually track him down quite quickly and fight him, but he's executed by a sniper, revealing the game's true antagonist, Tokai. As you progress, you help people out and eventually find out the truth behind what's going on. Tokai's father was executed by Iseo's group, but he believes they did it because they wanted to overthrow him and honor dictates he must avenge his father. However, on the flip side, you're informed Tokai's father deserved his execution, making Tokai's plan for revenge unjustified. Due to events of the game, other people start going after Tokai, and you pretty much get to choose whether they get their revenge on Tokai, which would cause the death of other people, or prevent it, save other people's lives, but betray the person who has been helping you this whole time. Depending what you choose affects what ending you get. Don't worry, I won't ruin that part, because for some reason it didn't record. Even if I die, Tokai will die first. I will make sure of it. Red Steel 2 is completely unrelated to the first one. You play as an unnamed man who is simply referred to as Hero and is the last surviving member of the Kisagari clan. Someone killed all the other members, Hero wants revenge. That's pretty much it. There is a little bit more to it than that, so go to this time to go straight to the point award and miss all the spoilers. There aren't that many actually. Just like with the first game, the person who you think is the main antagonist is fought fairly soon and it's then revealed who the main bad guy is, in this case discovering the identity of the man who killed your clansman, Shinjiro. He he knows you're coming so there are a few traps, you get betrayed by one of your friends because of course you do, people get kidnapped because of course they do, and you have a huge showdown with Shinjiro in one hell of an epic battle which luckily did record this time. It's just a shame that the ending is pretty much just a case of he walks off into the sunset. Decision time, which game has the better plot? I'd probably go Red Steel. It seems like a lot more time was put into writing a decent plot, which starts simple, save the kidnapped fiancé, but ends up becoming much more involved as you find out the truth behind what's going on, the motivations behind it all, and the final choice you get given at the end. The plot for Red Steel 2 certainly isn't bad and is quite enjoyable, but there's very little payoff for all your hard work. When you save the people that get kidnapped, one of them gets injured and is unconscious, but they tell you to finish things and that's the last we see of them, so God knows if they survive, what happened to them or anything. At least with Red Steel, you know everyone's fate once you've made your final decision. Follow me. I'll show you the way. Now that's the story out of the way, I'll move on to the gameplay, looking at how the story is told and how you progress through the game. With Red Steel, it's pretty much your usual go to a place to complete a mission. It seems most of the main cutscenes are shown as still images, which is fine, but proper videos would have been better. The game starts off in Los Angeles, but soon moves to Tokyo. You have a base of operation where someone gives you info on what's going on and sets up each mission. When you accept the next mission, you'll get a vague hint on what you need to do or where you need to go, and then as you move through the stage, various of 
objectives will pop up which are what you need to do in order to progress further like finding a key, creating a diversion or something else. Once you complete that objective, it won't be long before the next one pops up. Rinse and repeat until the main objective for that stage is completed. The game's pretty linear except when there are several people you need to help and although you can choose the order you help them in, there is a recommended order based on their difficulty. There's nothing during the stages to show you where you need to go or give any directions which can cause a little bit of randomly running around but the areas are fairly straightforward so figuring out where you need to go isn't massively difficult. Red Steel 2 is very different. It takes place in several areas, but you can run around the area and have a lot more freedom. There are bases of operation again, and it's here that you pick up your missions. The game is divided into acts, and each act has a number of missions to complete. There are several bases, and you can use any of them to start the next mission, which really makes progression easier. All you do is walk up to the mission board, select the next mission, you'll get a short briefing, and it's off to kick ass. There are side missions as well, but I'll discuss those more later. You have a mini map in the corner, which directs you to where you you need to be for the current story mission and seeing as some places are rather large having it is a godsend. You have to complete the story missions in a set order but even so it's great being able to run around between missions exploring all the nooks and crannies for hidden goodies. At the end of each stage in Red Steel, you get a mission briefing which tells you how well you did and gives you a grade. As I mentioned, I'm not very good at FPS games, so I rarely got a decent grade, but it was still good to see how I did. In Red Steel 2, there's nothing like that. No end of mission ranking, no stats, no nothing. Even at the end of the game, you don't get to find out how many of the hidden goodies you found. There's nothing. One thing that did bug me was that early in the game, you get given a hacking device that allows you to unlock doors and various other things, which was great. Great, but things you can use it on can only be interacted with when the story mission requires you to go that way. I get that it's to prevent you from going to places you shouldn't be going to yet, but arriving in a new area and seeing a load of locked doors filled me with glee about what I might be able to find hidden away until I realised I couldn't use my hacking device on any of it because the story missions hadn't yet told me to go there. It was ridiculous. Nobody could possibly think it would be a good idea to give the playable character abilities that you could have a lot of fun with and then not allow you you to use it purely because somebody else in the game hasn't said you could do it. Oh uh, wait. While both methods of gameplay have good and bad points, I think I'll be giving the point to Red Steel 2. When I first started it, I thought the whole select the mission from the board thing would end up getting dull, but having the mini-map really helped and being able to explore the areas ended up becoming a lot of fun. There's nothing wrong with the linear progression of Red Steel and I did enjoy the game, but the more open explorative style of Red Steel 2 really kicked things up a gear. Going on to the other characters you meet during the games. Both games have a fairly limited roster of recurring characters, so this shouldn't take too long. In Red Steel, you start off with Aseo and one of his friends, but once you move to Tokyo, you meet Harry and Otori, who are your main information people, and Otori's daughter Mariko, who teaches you sword techniques. The antagonists of the game Ryuichi and Tokyo aren't in the game all that much, just the odd scene here and there, so I can't really say much about them, but Tokai's reasons for doing what he did certainly makes fighting against him more than than just a good guy versus bad guy. The other characters are just bit characters who show up briefly, have a bit of a chat, maybe explain a few things and that's about it. While you're out on missions, you might get a phone call from Harry but for the most part you're on your own so you don't get to spend much time with your allies and as a result I didn't really care all that much about them, especially being told Sorry, Scott. No new move to for now. whenever you happen to get anywhere near her. In Red Steel 2, there are essentially people who have the same role as people in Red Steel. Swordmaster Jian is the one who teaches you new abilities, Judd is the sheriff who provides info, Tamiko is a hacker who also helps and provides info, and Songan who also helps out. They all help out a lot during your adventure, and you speak to them all on a regular basis, as well as keeping in contact via comms devices, so they all play a much larger role. It was just a case of, so which one of you will betray me first? The bad guys appear a little more than the bad guys from Red Steel did, and you still spend most of your time trying to find out where they are and chase them while they presumably sit around and wait for you to get there. Even so, the regular contact with your allies, the help they give you and the better animated cutscenes did make me care about the characters more than I did for anyone in Red Steel, so the point goes to Red Steel 2.
I see that you've lost your sword. That's just great. Well, now take mine, but don't lose it! Next up is the combat, and I know what you're thinking. They're FPS games, why are you talking about combat? Well, as you've probably seen from the footage shown so far, you switch between first-person gunfights to first-person swordplay, but how each game treats each aspect is vastly different. In Red Steel, you run around shooting bad guys and you restock your ammo from the weapons they drop. You can carry two guns at a time and switch between them whenever you want, but it's the Bioshock Infinite issue where if the enemies don't use a gun you like, you're pretty much stuffed. What's really handy is you soon learn an ability to pretty much stop time and pick off targets or shoot their guns to disarm them. Taking out the leader of a group forces the entire group to surrender. You have a bar in the bottom right corner which is filled by getting consecutive hits against targets and luckily you can use the ability anytime even if the bar isn't completely filled. You just get longer to select your targets the more the bar is filled and I use this ability a lot. In Red Steel 2, you start off with one gun but can buy three more as the game progresses and you can switch between all four whenever you want. Ammo is found from defeated enemies as well as from crates around the place. I found that ammo for certain weapons like the pistol seemed to drop a lot more frequently than others. I tended to use the pistol the most anyway, but I would have used the others more if ammo was a bit more readily available, but I guess it just makes you save the ammo for more powerful weapons for when it's needed even if some weapons like the machine gun weren't all that great. The biggest change is with the sword fights. In Red Steel, you'll spend most of your time shooting everyone, but now and then you'll enter a one-on-one -on -one sword fight. When these happen, Scott draws his sword and focuses on the opponent. At the start, you can mostly just wail on them and eventually win, but as the game progresses, you'll need to pay attention to their movement and attack patterns and dodge, parry or counter accordingly in order to overcome your enemy and carry on. In Red Steel 2, you can switch between gun and sword whenever you want. You don't even need to press a button to switch. If you have your gun out and you swing the Wiimote, you'll strike with your sword. If you have your sword, sword out and you press the gun trigger, you'll fire your gun. You can lock onto a target in either gun or sword mode and just like for Zelda games, you can switch between targets. When you go for the sword, if you do a small swing, you do a light strike, but if you do a large swing, you do a strong strike which not only does more damage, but can also wear down armour. The downside is that because you point at the screen to look around and you have to swing the Wiimote a lot to reduce the enemy's armour, you can end up moving your viewpoint which you really don't want to do and screw yourself over when you're trying to see what your opponents are up to. You don't have this problem in Red Steel, seeing as all sword fights are one-on-one -on -one focused battles, so you don't need to worry about what other people are doing. The downside is that whilst the sword fights are okay, they're a little too regular and end up just breaking the flow. You'll be having a good time battling your way through the crowds, only for the action to come to a sudden halt for a sword fight. When you beat someone, you can choose whether to let them live or finish them off. Letting them live gains you respect, which I'll talk more about later, but killing them gets you nothing. It doesn't change the plot, the route you take, what other people do, nothing. You don't even get an awesome death scene, you just smack him around the mush and that's it. So yes, you get a choice, but it's pretty pointless. Most of the time, especially towards the end of the game, the sword fights happen so often they just end up becoming a little dull and I wish you could do an Indiana Jones and move on. Ultimately, the point for combat goes to Red Steel 2. It's a shame the slow down time ability isn't in Red Steel 2, but even without the assistance of the Wii Motion Plus, the free switching between gun and sword, the limited guns but regular ammo and not having to come to a grinding halt every 10 minutes made the combat much more enjoyable. It's the extra bits and pieces that each game has to offer to keep you entertained during the adventure and after it's come to an end, even if it is already fairly clear which game will end up with the highest score. I mentioned before that Red Steel is much more linear than Red Steel 2, but between missions you visit a dojo and a nightclub. At the dojo you can learn new katana abilities, which was great, but as with most games, when you're in the middle of a fight, remembering the combos goes out the window. If you start one, it does show you the remaining steps to finish the combo, but with how unreliable the motion sensor was, there were only a couple of moves that I could use reliably. When you go to the club there's a firing range, and as you progress through the game, you can get to try out different types of guns, and if you manage to shoot 80% of the targets, you can 
access to gun whenever you go to the club, so between missions you can pick the guns you want to take with you, even if it's only until you run out of ammo and need to switch guns anyway because the bad guys use different guns. In Red Steel 2, there is no shooting range because you only have the four guns, but instead, when you visit Jean, you can buy skills for the katana and gun, which you can then upgrade. Judd offers upgrades for the guns themselves, and Son Gun has other things you can buy like health and armor expansions, so you'll be needing a lot of money. There were several times I'd have several hundred thousand dollars, do some upgrades, and spend the lot very quickly, but if you just stick to buying upgrades for the things you use most, it's not too bad. Luckily, there are plenty of ways to get cash, like battling groups of dudes, smashing boxes and completing side quests. When you go to the board you have the main string of story quests but the ones above and below the main line are side quests and they can be completed at any time as long as they are done before you move on to the next area. Some quests are repeated like having to find wanted posters of yourself or unlocking communications towers but as they can be done during the main quests you'll probably stumble across most of the objectives as you're wandering around and they'll just be the last few missing ones that you'll need to hunt before you move on and when you're finished they grant you a lot of money. There's nothing like that in Red Steel, which is a shame as it would have been nice to have a few optional things to do that could have helped or hindered depending whether or not you did them. I briefly mentioned a respect meter you can build up, but I had to look up what it actually did. You earn points by performing the katana combos you've learned, disarming enemies, and sparing defeated enemies after a sword fight. The higher your respect level, the more moves you can learn at the dojo, which mostly go on use, and the weapons you can try at the shooting range for your collection to take with you on missions, which you'll only end up replacing with the weapons your enemies are using anyway. The best use is that it increases the bar for focus time and increases how quickly the bar can be filled, which is great and all, but it would have been nice if the respect level actually affected the game itself, like when you pick your mission. Each mission has a recommended respect level, but you can do the mission regardless of what your respect level actually is. It would have been great if you managed to achieve the recommended respect level and the person helped you in some way, even if it was just giving you a key to a room filled with goodies. Just something. Pleased to see you again, Skosan. Pleased to see you again, Skosan. The final thing to talk about are the two things in Red Steel 2 that Red Steel doesn't have. The first is difficulty settings. It has the usual easy, medium and ninja, yes I did the game on easy, sue me, which is a very easy way for any game to instantly increase the replay value of a game. Playing Red Steel I died a lot. Sometimes it was my own fault for not hiding and thinking I'd be okay to Leroy Jenkins my way through and other times I was just unlucky. Either way, I saw the game over screen quite a few times during my journey, but in Red Steel 2, I only died two or three times. Granted, I had the game on easy, but seeing as I died a few times on easy, it goes to show the game isn't a simple walk in the park, so if I tried it on Ninja, I'd probably get annihilated. The other is a challenge mode, which I was really disappointed with. It just has you replaying missions or entire chapters, and you get a score at the end, but from what I hear, all you get scored on is the amount of money you found. I don't think you actually get anything for doing it, so doing challenge mode is really for its own sake, and seeing as it pretty much just has you replay the game, you might as well just start the game again on a higher difficulty setting. Apparently the developers originally had a lot more planned for the challenge mode, but weren't able to implement it due to time constraints. At least with Red Steel 2, all the extra goodies packed into the main game, like the upgrades and new abilities, were really useful. I still had certain abilities I favoured and used regularly, but I still used most of the others every now and again, whereas in Red Steel I used a few moves a lot and everything else just got ignored. It's a shame the uses for the respect meter were so limited, just like it's a shame the challenge mode wasn't as in-depth as it could have been, but with what's on offer, the point and the clear win goes to Red Steel 2. Although Red Steel 2 is the superior game, that's not to say that Red Steel is a bad game, not in the slightest. When I replayed it to capture all the footage, I still very much enjoyed playing the game despite the issues I had with the controls and the sword fights constantly breaking the pace. Red Steel 2 manages to solve those issues, add loads more content and become a much more fun game to play. See you next time.